Hello, and welcome to the Think JSA webinar series, brought to you by the Office for Strategic Engagement. Today, we are pleased to present a distinguished speaker. This session is unclassified and will be recorded and posted to the JSAO network. Please keep in mind that the views and opinions expressed by all participants do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policy of the U.S. government, Department of Defense, or U.S. SOCOM. If you have questions after this session, please email thinkjsau at jsau.edu. Good afternoon. Welcome to Think JSAL. Today, I have the privilege to interview a fellow counterintelligence and special forces professional with an extensive background in national security, Colonel retired Mr. Christopher Costa. Mr. Costa currently serves as the executive director of the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C., and prior to that position, served as a special assistant to the president and senior director for counterterrorism at the White House. His commendable government service to our nation spans three and a half decades and includes 25 years in Army counterintelligence, human intelligence, and special operations spanning four continents. In 2013, Chris was inducted into the United States Special Operations Commando Hall of Honor for a lifetime service to U.S. Special Operations. Chris is an accomplished academic. He is an adjunct associate professor for the Georgetown University Security Studies Program, Walsh School of Foreign Studies since 2021 and was a senior adjunct instructor with Norwich University. Chris has been published and interviewed by several news agencies and universities to include Joint Special Operations University. As a subject matter expert on various national security topics, this brings us to the genesis of today's interview, an article Chris recently had published by The Hill titled, The New Era of Counterintelligence Must Shift to the Gray Zone. Chris, welcome back to Think JSL. I'm looking forward to discussing your changes of the CI landscape from global war on terrorism to great power competition. I'm hearing your thoughts on Special Operations Force counterintelligence integration. It's a pleasure and honor to have you here today for this interview. I think the audience and listeners will be eager to hear your insights and thoughts on this topic, counterintelligence Mike, Mike. and soften the gray zone. If I just wanted to say thank you, it's a privilege anytime I have an opportunity to talk to the, the special operations enterprise and participate in a JSAO event. So thank you very much for having me. No, I, I greatly appreciate this, Chris. Uh, I've read your article and I immediately went and talked to Dr. Oakley here, uh, who's a professor and now part of the JSAO press. And I give him a shout out because he put me in touch with you and uh, we are here today because of uh, those relationships and that trust and confidence in one another that you built over the years. So uh, again, thank you. And I'll turn the floor over to you if you have any opening comments. Otherwise, we'll get right into the questions. No, again, Mike, it, it is truly a privilege to to be able to talk to you about counterintelligence. I think it's a really important topic and i'm really appreciative and i said this to you yesterday that you picked up on the article and understood that it, it it's an important thesis i think uh, i mean it can be proved wrong right but i think it's really important for us to have these kinds of discussions in these kinds of forums so thank you again for having me right up front we'll get on to question one so chris do you mind telling us what motivated you to write the hill article why now? Yeah. Thanks for the question. Why now is I wanted an opportunity really to uh, reflect on the last few years, um, having come out of the White House focused specifically on counterterrorism, 18 hours a day. My team was extraordinary. And I started seeing a shift even at the NSC as early as 2017, the idea that, hey, we're going to be pivoting toward great power competition. General H.R. McMaster, the National Security Advisor, wrote about that in a book and spoke a lot about uh, China and great power competition in terms of coercive policies. And as a lifetime intelligence officer and somebody that spent the bulk of his career focusing on counterterrorism, I really wanted an opportunity to see things play out and have the time to reflect, read, and think through 
you know, what does great power competition mean in terms of number one, counterterrorism, and number two, what does it mean practically for special operations? So I really felt a sense of urgency in this last year as I started spending more time focused on counterintelligence. Again, going back to my roots, talking to the CI division at FBI in multiple forums, private forums, and one-on-one -on -one discussions with leadership to include even having the opportunity to talk to Director Ray out in, in Arizona at the McCain Institute. In fact, the SOCOM commander was there and I had an opportunity, then General Clark, I should say, I had an opportunity to talk to uh, Director Ray about uh, counterintelligence specifically in the threat from China, Iran. Russia. So I really felt a sense of urgency, but I also built in time to really think through and pulse the community on, you know, my my argument that we really need to pivot toward great power competition and counterintelligence is going to be a principal tool. Oh, I thank you for that. And I know we've talked over the last uh, few weeks and days uh, leading up to this and counterintelligence has uh, garnered a lot of attention recently. Uh, the National CI strategy in 2020 to 2022 highlights the threat by our foreign adversaries and the fact that they're becoming more complex and more divisive and harmful to U.S. interests. Um, you mentioned in this in your article, uh, coin of the uh, CI is the coin of the realm in this fight. Can you elaborate? Yeah, in some ways, it was a little tongue in cheek. Maybe I'm the only one that gets it uh, in terms of my personal experiences. But it, circa 2001, 9 11, um, I started hearing from general officers, some that were coaches and mentors of mine. Hey, Chris, you know, human is the coin of the realm. And I chuckled a little bit because, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, when I was you know, trained as a case officer and in, in doing human operations, it really was a bit of a death knell. There were a few of us that conducted human operations, but intuitively, especially the merger, you know, my personal experiences in special operations, in the enterprise, it, with task forces, um, even even back during Operation Just Cause, it gave me an appreciation of the the human discipline, but how critical it was having a foundation in counterintelligence. Uh, I mean, frankly, the 470th Military Intelligence Group down in Panama during the invasion of Panama was very, very uh, CI centric. So I had the opportunity to study counterintelligence in one of our first conflicts since, you know, post Vietnam in Panama. And then I, I was trained as a counterintelligence agent, and all of that gave me an excellent foundation. So post 9-11, as the seniors talked about the, the crucial nature of human in terms of countering terrorism, it was intuitive to me, but at the same time, it truly was the coin of the realm. If you had a human background, if you had a counterintelligence background, that certainly was helpful. But it was about tactical human teams that were we were fielding. It was around, uh, very much about sensitive activities and uh, special mission units. And I think um, that clearly, clearly, we are pivoting now toward this idea that counterintelligence, at least it's my fundamental belief, that counterintelligence really is the most crucial discipline in countering malign behavior from intelligence services overseas that are testing us in, in space, um, you know, such as Syria and Africa and filling vacuums in this great power competition. So I started seeing it while I was at the White House and I spoke about it publicly on many occasions and did some interviews where I really stressed the fact that the nation can do both. This nation certainly can do counter terrorism as well as counterintelligence work, but I truly believe 
that we're pivoting to a place that counterintelligence is going to be crucial. And we can tease that idea out a little bit, what I mean practically, but I think it's it's absolutely crucial in the, the months ahead in great power competition. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Chris. Um, and that carries me right into the next question. You, you highlight the need for soften the intelligence community to collaborate on counterintelligence in unprecedented ways in your article. Uh, what recommendations do you have to make this kind of a reality? I know uh, all those lessons learned from CT over the past 20 years, we don't want to lose those. And I think they were pivotal to the collaboration, the communication, and, and the ability to find, fix, and finish the enemy as quickly as we did. Understand in a counterintelligence fight, the finish might not be a kinetic finish. It might be uh, a judicial finish, or it might be some other finish mechanism. Um, but I'll turn it over to you. No, you, you're getting to the heart of the matter. Frankly, special operators are problem solvers, no matter where they came from, wh whether they're SEALs or Marine Raiders, Rangers, Green Berets, Special Forces guys, the bottom line is soft are problem solvers. What we have to do is change our mindset that, and you just said it, that a judicial finish, an arrest might be good enough. Um, we have to change what sates our appetite, right? We got comfortable with conducting kinetic counterterrorism operations. I got comfortable overseeing those kinds of operations. And from a policy standpoint, it became a rote drill as well. I mean, one of the policies that I can't talk a lot about is our direct action policy. We spent a lot of time refining it, and I'm proud of the work that we did in the Trump administration. From day one, the first policy meeting was about direct action, and it was classified and recently declassified by the current administration. That's beside the point. The key is we got very comfortable and very good at kinetic finishes. Now, counterintelligence finishes means you might conduct a surveillance. You meaning soft, might conduct a surveillance for another agency, might be a part of a task force, operate overseas, solving a problem, which is identify what hostile intelligence services are doing, provide support from operators. But at the end of the day, the finish might be a photograph. The finish might be a report. The finish might be some kind of technical collection. The finish might not be completely revealed to the soft operators themselves. And soft has to be comfortable with that. It's a new kind of mission. Uh, counterintelligence at times, and I don't mean this in a disparaging way, but it can be like watching paint dry, right? Um, conducting a surveillance. Uh, things don't happen at the pace of counterterrorism. So mentally, there has to be a shift. Culturally, there has to be a shift. But since soft are problem solvers, we can complement the rest of the force shifting to this idea of great power competition. And to put it more tactically, the intelligence officers out there from Russia, FSB, SVR, GRU, they're sloppy, but they're also aggressive. We have to counter and we have to uh, detect them. We have to deter their operations and we have to do that in clever ways and we'll have to dust off lessons from the Cold War. I'm sure we can talk more about that. I don't want to get too tactical, but at the end of the day, we're not talking about a kinetic finish. We're talking about dis disrupting intelligence officers' activities when they're operating in a space that we're vying for influence in that gray zone, short of war. Now, we have to find the thresholds for conducting these operations without triggering shooting. This happened during the Cold War. Um, and sometimes shots were fired. But at the end of the day, we we have to get to the point where we can operate, we can disrupt these intelligence services uh, from operating and uh, do so without triggering some kind of conflagration, right? Some kind of war. No, I couldn't agree with you more on that one, because the the kinetic mindset that has been bred into soft over the last 20 years it, it it's going to take that cultural uh shift it, you have to change the mindset you have to change the culture in which that mindset resides 
which we're trying to do here from an education standpoint, uh, both on the educating our soft CI professionals, but also educating our soft enterprise on what those counterintelligence threats are to the force, how counterintelligence is a value uh, added to them, and they can help impose costs strategically against the adversary by just letting their counterintelligence professionals do their job. That's probably be, been the biggest uh, hurdle over the past 20 years is everything has been, like you said, tactical human, uh, kinetic, and counterintelligence is a slow, methodical process. But in this new era of great power competition, we, we have to become more dynamic. We have to become more proactive in our approach and willing to take those risks uh, in order to impose that cost against the adversary because that's what they're doing against us. Which brings us to the next question. Can you share your thoughts on the current national security challenges stemming from China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and violent extremist organizations? How do CI professionals within the soft enterprise partner with service department CI organizations, interagency partners, intelligence community partners, allies and foreign partners to confront these challenges. I think you were already kind of alluding to some of that in your previous uh, remarks. No, I'd, I'd be happy to try to tackle that. It's a lot to digest, but I think we can cover the waterfront. We'll start first with China. So just an example, a metaphor, uh, just a, a few vignettes. I think last October 2022, right back in October, the FBI did a a press conference along with Department of Justice, Director Ray spoke about three operations that were all disrupted. Eastern District of New York, some of my friends that prosecute CT cases or terrorism cases, um, and, and frankly, I've worked with EDNY on MS-13 and some other problems uh, since I left the U.S. government. The bottom line is Chinese were conducting uh, essentially operations against DOJ, trying to recruit a prosecutor. And much to my surprise, uh, DOJ revealed the fact that there was a double agent operation and the FBI did exactly what you expect good counterintelligence to do. And that is to operate both offensively as well as defensively. That was one particular case. A prosecutor apparently was uh, was the target of a Chinese operation to really ferret out what DOJ was going to do against a, a certain company. You can guess what the company is. I won't, although it's out there, I'm not going to talk about it. That was one case. Then another case, uh, all linked uh, to some a, dozen Chinese intelligence officers or co-optees. Another case was going off after Chinese dissidents here in the United States. And more classically, a third case was uh, Chinese uh, trying to ferret their way into a think tank um, and uh, essentially recruit someone uh, as an influencer. So that was just China. But the bottom line is Director Ray, the director of MI5 publicly, and I believe the director of MI6, the Secret Intelligence Service, all three of these actors have come out, these officials on and spoken about China, China um, stealing, co coercing their way into a competitive advantage. So that's China. Let's talk about Russia for a second. Russia's a spoiler. Um, over a decade ago, I wrote, uh, contributed to writing to a strategy at of one of our naval special warfare organizations. And uh, it was the first time we published a strategy. And we built into it the, uh, the idea of the threat. And specifically, we wrote in a decade ago, the idea that Russia is going to continue to be a bit of a spoiler and a threat. And I remember, I won't say who, but a former senior official from the State Department loved the strategy, guffawed at the idea that Russia was a threat in any way, shape or form. And of course, we stuck to our guns. I'd talked to defectors, former Russian intelligence officers at a very senior level that said Russia will continue to be a threat to the United States. And that has proven absolutely accurate. In fact, they're not just a spoiler now. They truly are posing a significant threat to uh, European security. 
in terms of talking about, you know, uh, nuclear weapon use on the battlefield, not to mention assassinations, not to mention uh, non-official cover operations or commercial operations here in the United States to build a legend and a cover uh, to perhaps uh, subvert third countries such as Moldova. So this smacks of the Cold War, but frankly, it's more lethal. It's more prodigious if you listen to seniors at the FBI. And I am now convinced that we're in a completely different era of aggressiveness in terms of Russia. Um, Iran, just one example, the idea that the Iranians would also identify dissident in Brooklyn, a woman, and target her for not only an assassination, but uh, conduct pre-operational activity, not to mention the idea that uh, the pre-operational, you know, reconnaissance, et cetera, uh, in some cases was done by American private investigators, not knowing that they're supporting Iranian collection. I believe that happens with China too. The point is Iran, Russia, China, extremely aggressive. And that's here in the United States. The focus of my article, I think, I should say parenthetically, the FBI is doing a great job from my optic here in the United States. But the threat is so pervasive, it's so large that we were going to have to start thinking creatively about how to how to resource and help, how DOD can help, for example, the FBI. Um, so that's, you know, maybe that's something we can talk about. But overseas, these intelligence services and proxies and surrogates like the Wagner Group are in our space. They're influencing um, countries in places we need to be in Africa, uh, the Sahel in particular. So at the end of the day, those actors are providing a significant challenge to the United States and to the West more broadly in terms of great power competition. And just a word, I can't say a lot about North Korea. I don't track them as closely as perhaps I should, uh, but I, I think it's more about understanding their proliferation network and understanding how they're getting things brought into North Korea that they shouldn't have access to, uh, to further you know, their, their R&D. In terms of violent extremists, racially and ethnically motivated violent extremists. You pick your choice or term of art, terrorists, political violent actors. Bottom line is that is not gonna go away. ISIS is gonna continue to pose a threat more regional than global. Um, but at the end of the day, we cannot take our eye off of the terrorist threat. Although on balance, I think it is shifting the threat from terrorists is shifting from Islamist terrorists more to um, an amalgamation, sort of a, uh, you know, pick your ideology and uh, and then execute on that ideology, some kind of political violence because of a grievance. So I think we're going to see more terrorism from anti-government actors and the ideology is going to be less pure. Director Ray's also talked about that as well. So that's kind of my take of the waterfront. I, I know I went on a long time, but I think it's a loaded question. No, I, I appreciate the response, Chris. Um, I want to take a minute and kind of share an excerpt from Senator Roger Wicker's opening statement during the recent Senate Armed Service Committee's 2023 posture statement hearing for SOCOM and Cybercom. Uh, Wicker said, the United States faces the most complex and daunting set of security challenges since the height of the Cold War, from the Chinese Communist Party's unprecedented military buildup and grow, growing hegemonic ambition to Russia's brazen and unprovoked attack on Ukraine. Our adversaries are testing an American resolve. Our foremost adversary and competitor, the Chinese Communist Party, has stressed both SOCOM and CyberCom in ways we've never imagined a decade ago, as you just highlighted. I, I sit there and I look at that, and then I look at uh, the national defense and military strategies and what it states that the joint force is at an inflection point. I mean, our adversaries are more sophisticated, they're technologically capable and willing to achieve their goals to revise 
uh, the global norms and challenge the rules-based international order to support their ideals. Uh, the nation and the Department of Defense have been focused literally on counter VEO and coin operations uh, for the last 20 years, spearheaded by SOCOM and the preponderance of the DOD. I, I sit there and I, I, I think back when great power competition first came on uh, when I was down at Sox South as the as an Intel professional down there. And at first it wasn't resonating. Um, but once you start really peeling back the onion, we see what is going on as evidenced by the balloons flying over, uh, the CONUS area here in the United States. The fact that China has integrated itself into every bit of our economy and is, uh, subversively using it to, commit espionage to control political figures and businesses. And there's just not enough counterintelligence out there to, to fight it. So what are some ways that we can partner better with interagency? I know you mentioned uh, in our previous conversations, the joint terrorism task forces uh, that were stood up after 9-11. The, um, I know we talked about McChrystal's team of teams concept and the, uh, some of the other concepts, uh, that came out as a result of needing to flatten that, uh, that communication, break down those stove pipes without degrading our security, but ultimately empowering those at the tip of the spear or at the tip of the dagger to really, uh, get after and be proactive at imposing costs. Uh, can you talk to that? Yeah, again, great question, a loaded question. I don't think it's as complicated as we make it collectively at times. That's my assessment because we have done this before. I will say that uh, people kind of guffaw at the idea of the 90s, you know, prior to 9-11, but we really truly did wrestle with a changing, a dramatically changing world in the 1990s, where the idea of the military operating in a space, a non-lethal space like Bosnia, was so risky from a government standpoint, from a military standpoint, because we weren't permitted to make the kinds of mistakes that that we've made post 9-11 that had lethal consequences. In other words, the threshold for mistakes was was very different. Our risk calculus was very dis dif difficult and challenging in the 90s as a result of our experience in Somalia, for example. But all of that said, 9-11 happens and the United States government pivoted in admirable ways. Now, we made mistakes, but the United States government pivoted to build a counter-terrorism enterprise. And I was part of that enterprise. In some ways, I was at the very tail end. I was a part of it operationally all along the way, but then being there watching the physical destruction of, of or the destruction of the physical ISIS caliphate, if you will. So I watched all of that play out and it was an excellent um, perch to really uh, see how the how the CT enterprise has grown, how it evolved, and uh, some of our, you know, uh, our um, mistakes, as I mentioned along the way. But all of that said, if we built an enterprise for counterterrorism, it doesn't take that much to build in time and replicate some of the lessons that we learned for counterterrorism. And you mentioned it, General McChrystal was a pioneer, the team of teams crushing the stovepipes, forcing collaboration until it hurts, letting people make mistakes, uh, fighting the bureaucratic fight as well as the physical fight overseas. We have to be able to do that now. The good news is we are comfortable with partners on counterterrorism, and we have to take that, that ethos and apply it to counterintelligence. And for folks that's that are skeptical, I'll just offer you my first experience as a counterintelligence agent overseas was with the 650th MI group. 
serving NATO since the 1950s, where we worked in those days with 16 NATO countries. There are more now, 16 NATO countries where counterintelligence was, you know, vigorously protected by states. They didn't want to share those secrets. But over time, we built up a confidence level that our NATO partners could share counterintelligence information. Ultimately, CI was a national responsibility. That will not change. But what we can do is move in the direction that 650th went for decades of breaking down some of the stovepipes to conduct multi lateral operations to do defensive as well as offensive counterintelligence. It can be done. 650th proved that to me in the early 1990s, working with foreign partners, conducting complex investigations. We're talking about penetrations of NATO headquarters by East Germans and Russians or Soviets at the time. So we have to take those lessons, we have to break down the stovepipes, and we have to have a will to do it. The problem we have, Mike, and I think this audience more than most will certainly appreciate the fact that without a 9-11, without a catalyzing event, we're not going to be able to galvanize the resources. So a lot of people are going to be, you know, screaming at the rooftop, so to speak, and the, the average person on the street is not is going to think the threat's bad. It's not good, but it's not existential. It's not um, it's not something that we have to pivot toward like counterterrorism. And I think that would be wrongheaded, right? Because it erodes our democracy. That's what the CI strategy talked about, an erosion of democracy by disinformation directed at the United States, at our electoral process, using disinformation to sow discord in the United States, to take advantage of an environment where people are dissatisfied coming out of the pandemic. It's not just in the United States. It is, in fact, a global dynamic. But all of that said, now having heard myself say all that, maybe it is more complicated than I am um, that I'm allowing, but I, I just have confidence in the soft enterprise. I have con confidence in our nation and uh, our decision makers to make the adjustments. I just don't know what's going to prompt those adjustments quick enough. I, I, yeah, I couldn't have said it better, Chris. The, I was sitting there reading the news this morning and, uh, it was either secretary of the air force or one of the, um, Air Force uh, seniors was highlighting the fact that China, in addition to Russia and the U.S., are now really the top three nuclear powers. And not only does that concern them, the fact that China is continually uh, building their nuclear program while Russia is becoming more aggressive in their rhetoric as it pertains to the use of nuclear weapons, uh, walking this counterintelligence uh, line as it uh, pertains to great power competition is going to be a fine one. Um, making sure that we don't push so hard back against the, the penetrations and the disinformation and the subversion that these revisionist states are doing that we trigger a conflict or we trigger them to or back them into a corner where they see they have no other recourse. But that brings me to my third question. So what recommendations for policymakers do you have as it applies to CI and SOF operating in the gray zone to strategically compete against our nation's adversaries? Yes. Yeah, so I haven't given a great deal of thought to kind of the policy output um, frankly, what I want to see replicated is the interagency process start taking on a more deliberate approach to counterintelligence. So when I had a, you know, a, a cacophonous uh, threat dynamic, always noise, lots happening, focused on the threat with, with my team at the White House linked to an interagency, 
that didn't require policy. That was the national security staff working for the president of the United States in the office of the president using the bully pulpit. I did in my position and representing uh, the president as one of his staff officers could help drive the inner agency. That and those kinds of things need to happen in terms of counterintelligence. With all the respect that I have uh, in terms of the sensitivities for counterintelligence information. But all of that said, Mike, I mean, the sensitivities for ongoing counterterrorism cases were significant, too. There was a lot at stake. There were American citizens that were being investigated. And you have to be careful. There are attorney general guidelines talking about how I, as a policymaker, can know about an investigation. And yet I'm responsible for the threat or collectively my office was at, at the White House. So all of that said, what I want to see is less focus focus on, on policy and more focus on, I guess, the practical matter of organizing the government in such a way to, uh, to ensure that we have the same optics on counterintelligence problems. Um, so I, I think that the authorities are in place. The things that we kind of, you and I talked about offline, the idea of resourcing this and, and the idea of detailing people, all of those things can give it, can get sorted out. Um, and never once was I caught up in those kinds of administrative or tactical discussions at the White House. They just happened once the White House pivoted and provided some guidance to the interagency, either with an ex, you know, a good policy document or uh, policy papers. The rest followed, right? So I think the interagency will follow, but they need specific guidance coming out of the White House. This is a time for national leadership on steroids, really. Um, not only for everything from mass shootings domestically in the domestic violent extremism threat to the overseas CT threat to what we're talking about here today, which is ensuring that we can aggressively counter malign intelligence activities from countries that wanna be disruptive to our policy um, objectives and do that in places like the Sahel, the Horn of Africa, Asia. Um, Asia is a big place and China is checking us in many of those places. Uh, fortunately, and this is where partnerships are so pivotal and we learned these lessons from a, a counterterrorism standpoint. The Australians are very much concerned with all of the same things that I just outlined. Um, I mean, I've even had an opportunity to talk to the director general of, um, you know, Australia's uh, security service, as well as the head of their intelligence service. They're thinking like we are. So there are force multipliers. But the other point I would make is we have to have non-traditional partnerships. And that also is starting to emerge, like uh, Japan uh, is going to spend more money than they ever had you know, since the Second World War on national defense. So non-traditional partnerships, uh, breaking down the stovepipes, learning from what we learned uh, in the post 9-11 era. So all of these things have to be, have to be focused on um, counterintelligence. And we can talk a little bit about what that means practically too, but I'll I don't want to dominate the conversation. I apologize again. It's so much to cover. I sit there and I look at the GMC, the Joint Interagency Intergovernmental Multinational and Commercial Landscape. And as a CI professional coming up through uh, the last 24 years, I I recognize that this is a error for counterintelligence to shine. Um, the creation of the National Counterintelligence Task Forces to mirror the national uh, CT task force, the fact that the FBI has created uh, CI task forces at every field office uh, across the United States is a huge win. The issue is making sure that those task forces have the right uh, personnel assigned to them, that they have people that are eager and willing to accept and take risks in this uh, arena, 
that they're empowered, and ultimately that we start breaking down these stovepipes and this compartmentalization. Amen. That's exactly right. And I couldn't have said it better myself. And really, the, those are some of the, you know, that's the blueprint from General McChrystal and others that followed suit. The task force model can get and it has to be carried overseas because, as you appreciate, the thrust of my article was focused very much overseas. I love the fact that JTTFs are being replicated here in the United States in terms of counterintelligence. I love the fact that there are some changes uh, that are being made by the United States Army with respect to counterintelligence. Um, so these are these are positive trends, but they're they're too little right now uh and, and we have to think more expansively to compete in this space because the other point you and i talked about and i would love to make for this audience it it's not a, a, a fun point to make but we are not for ordained to win this contest we can lose um and that concerns me and again the average american might say I don't understand how we're losing. I don't see it. I don't feel it. We're not losing troops. Um, how, you know, how are we losing? What are our metrics for success? They might not frame it that way, um, but they're going to see not the same kinds of urgency that, that we all saw collectively post 9-11. So the challenge is to, for our national leadership to really get the messaging right too. But we need to focus overseas as well as here in the United States. And it truly counterintelligence truly is both defensive and offensive. And what I argue for is far more aggressive offensive counterintelligence overseas. Yes, I completely agree. Um, the our allies and foreign partners, when you look at the soft enterprise, I mean, we're spread all over the globe at any given time. We work by, with, and through our partners on a daily basis. It's one of those you will work with your partners, both uh, our foreign partners, but also our interagency and IC partners. Um, I would also add in there our commercial and academic partners uh, are a must, especially as we look at uh, research development and acquisition and making sure our clear defense contractors are protected making sure that they're informed of the threat and they know how to protect themselves as well as the technologies and the information that they're receiving and working on on a daily basis. So one of the best examples of this uh, that I've seen recently was an operation I had the privilege of participating on uh, with Homeland Security Investigations, Operation Citadel. Um, I actually uh, worked with uh, Homeland Security and DHS to uh, get permission to to write about it, and it was published in the interagency journal um, a few years ago. But just that cohesiveness of bringing together our interagency partners, our IC partners, our DOD partners, OSADEF is the acronym. I can't remember what it stands for, but ultimately they would go down, train the foreign partners ju on their judicial system fix some of the laws so that way they could have that prosecution within their country um, against those uh, various threat networks. And it wasn't just CT, it was criminal, it was uh, counter espionage, counter intelligence related uh, topics as well. So I, we have great models to use. It's we need the leadership to want to accept the risk and be willing to empower. And I think that's, one of the biggest hurdles right now uh, within the counterintelligence field is risk aversion. Can you speak to that and how we can overcome that risk aversion? Well, I think uh, we, we have to dust off some of the lessons that we learned from the Cold War. Um, just a quick vignette, post 9-11, one of a, a quintessential operator who will remain anonymous, um, you might know him from the movies, uh, and again, that's not too much of a teaser, or, or, or that's not too much of a clue. We were conducting an after-action review, and he said, hey, listen, this isn't the Cold War. You know, we've got to stop. It, this is a well-respected operator, unequivocally, but, like, this isn't the Cold War. You know, we we don't need to have the, the kind of 
of tradecraft that we had during the uh, the Cold War. You know, we own the space essentially, and I've heard some of the, these themes before. And frankly, it was wrong in terms of what we're dealing with. Uh, the, the threat, as we've talked about, multi-dimensional. We have to go back and dust off some of the lessons from the Cold War. This is not a new Cold War, but there are lessons that we can apply. I mean, my best, you know, metaphor example, if you will, was you and I talked about this as well. This is culturally difficult for soft writ large. But when I was running networks and overseeing networks, working for General Mulholland and uh, had a task force, I went out and found counterintelligence folks that worked in the 70s and the 80s and were prepared to roll up their sleeves. I was um, giving them access to everything that we were doing. There were no secrets. They had an opportunity to look and throw cold water on our operations. And I think it's crucial that you take those kinds of risks first, the bureaucratic risks, the the operational risks will follow, but you have to take the bureaucratic risks. You have to put somebody um, into your task forces that can look under the tent, that come from maybe a different agency. That's an anathema to this community. And I did it. And I was the commander and I could have done it. But at the end of the day, there's some resistance to that. We want to protect our operations. We fall in love with our operations. Those are systemic problems, cultural problems that have to be addressed. In terms of risk, I mean, all I can say is I have had the benefit of being able to walk for decades, walk into commanders, having thought through the argument, the counter argument, and been objective and usually got what I want despite the risks uh, because I was able to offer um, the downside of the operation objectively, and I never fell in love with the course of action. And we alluded to this in some of our previous discussions. Some of these operations played out in Bosnia when the, the, the nation was completely risk averse as a result of some of what happened uh, operationally in Somalia. So our level of tradecraft had to be exceedingly high. And we couldn't fail. And this was not a lethal environment. So the bottom line is we've got generations now of officers and non-commissioned officers and operators who have operated in a space where, where lethality was high. We lost people. So I think that, uh, that we have enough conditioned officers and non-commissioned officers out there that understand how to manage risk. But this is a different kind of fight. And what we don't talk a lot about, Mike, is, you know, specifically, you know, be specific, Costa, you know, what are you talking about in terms of aggressively operating at going after intelligence officers overseas. Well, I'm talking about disrupting their activities. If they have a meeting and we know about their meeting, we want to disrupt their meeting. We want them to be late for their meeting. We want them to miss their meeting. What is the risk associated with that uh, in terms of, of counterterrorism, right, where we lost operators uh, on, on the battlefield during a kinetic operation, trying to achieve a jackpot. The bottom line is we just have to condition ourselves to know how to disrupt our adversaries, and we have to be prepared, um, you know, for for uh, a counterfight, a counterpunch, if you will. It, it can get pretty sporty as long as it doesn't turn into a shooting war. But if it does, we got to be prepared to execute that. Um, you know, we killed something like 100 people while I was at the White House, um, you know, that that were uh, not part of uh, of the Russian military, but were essentially and ostensibly surrogates. Uh, they threatened U.S. Uh, U.S. installation on the ground in Syria and strikes took place because we were threatened. We accepted risk with that. Uh, so I. I, I don't want to make too much of risk aversion. I think that we are conditioned um, after a couple decades of fighting uh, overseas to to doing the right things operationally. 
Yes. Um, I, I love the example of being able to disrupt a intelligence officer, a foreign intelligence officer's uh, activities, make them late. That's imposing costs. You're, like you said, what's the harm of, hey, maybe you just find out where they're going to meet and you go sit down in their seat or you go sit in the, uh, at the table beside them. Right. And right. now you, you put them in that uncomfortable seat. You, you cause them to be back on their heels and figure out, okay, what, what do I need to do to be able to conduct my activities? Now you're causing them to waste time and to use their resources to have to counter everything that we're doing. So definitely think those are viable options that we can do. I mean, there's a, a litany of others that we can talk about. Um, I sit there and I, I, I look at how Director Ray mentioned that there's over 2,000 counterintelligence investigations against the Chinese alone for espionage-related activities, a lot of them within the cyber domain, and uh, targeting our information and our technology. And they're opening up a new investigation every 12 hours, in essence. And I'm like, okay, what what are we doing to deter that behavior? What are we doing to uh, to inhibit that behavior from uh, taking in place. If we're not putting those intelligence officers or those uh, foreign collectors on notice and letting them know we know what they're doing and it's not going to be accepted, much like what we did with uh, the Chinese balloons flying overhead, uh, we sent a clear message, this is no longer tolerated, and we shot them out of the sky. We need to do the same thing on the ground and in cyberspace against these foreign intelligence adversaries to let them know this is no longer acceptable behavior. No, you're exactly right. And this is, and you're getting to the point, this is also a combination of information operations wrapped into counterintelligence, which also runs a counter in that, no pun intended, it runs counter to the counterintelligence discipline itself. You, you're, you're secret, very secretive. There are, you know, it's behind the green door that, that goes back to, you know, Vietnam era, that kind of language. Uh, the bottom line is now the FBI is figuring out a couple things. One, the fact that they're doing public programs with the International Spy Museum. We're having an opportunity where I have an opportunity to talk to um, assistant director responsible for counterintelligence to the nation, right? Um, I'm able to have a program with him publicly to educate the public, to discuss what the FBI is doing. The FBI has pivoted and changed and evolved culturally to understand that they have to engage the public. They have to educate the public. And we have to publish things like indictments. In the past, that was a admission of some kind of failure. And again, counterintelligence is a national responsibility. You don't want to tell your adversaries that you've been penetrated, uh, that you have a mole. And this goes back to, you know, there's a TV show re reflecting uh, Kim Philby and the historical example of the Cambridge Five. All of those dynamics played out through the Cold War. What's different now is our information domain has changed. And now the director of national intelligence has, has taken a significant role at declassifying information and sharing it with the public. It's no accident that an indictment was just published of a deep cover uh, GRU operator that came to the United States to refine his legend and uh, tried to get into the Netherlands. I mean, it was ham-handed. It was almost uh, comical in terms of the failures of tradecraft. Do you think it's an accident that the FBI decided to publish the indictment uh, in some of the details of internal communications between Handler and GRU would be a uh, non-official cover operator? No, uh, we want to publicize these kinds of failures. So I think the United States is becoming more sophisticated in terms of how we are going to, to get to the heart of the matter, how the United States is changing 
you know, the, the domestic counterintelligence front by engaging the public. And I didn't mention another significant initiative that the FBI ha has, and that is engage with the, the private sector in ways they never would have engaged historically. Unequivocally, the FBI is now engaged in the private sector in ways they have never engaged with the private sector uh, historically. It's absolutely crucial. So these kinds of things are going to be a competitive advantage going forward. Completely agree on that one. I had read a paper slightly dated, I think it was 2017, and it talked about how countries have a counterintelligence uh, mindset and woven into their cultures. China has it, Russia has it. It's very, uh, you saw it during Nazi Germany, very integrated within their their fiber and their society, whereas the U.S. doesn't really have that. They uh, they're, were pivoting towards it uh, with the recent changes with how the FBI is sharing information and engaging uh, both the private sector, industry, academia, and uh, the American populace. But for the longest time during this, it, it just kind of faded away and has been lost on the last few generations. And I think we need to reinstitute that. We need to reinvigorate that because otherwise China is going to continue to exploit our soft underbelly. And that soft underbelly is our economy. That soft underbelly is our uh, industry and our uh, education system and our businesses um, because they know that's how you get to uh, our defense apparatus, that we have to work with those clear defense contractors, and they are part of that weak link within the, the supply chain. And if we don't do anything about it, if we sit there and continually keep our head in the dirt like an ostrich or we turn a blind eye to it and say that the threat's not really there, we're doing ourselves a disservice. And like you said, we're not destined to win this. Uh, it's going to be a matter of rallying the nation as a whole, like we did around 9-11, to push back on the subversive revisionist states uh, agenda, both China, Russia, and then you got the rogue states like Iran and North Korea uh, that are also just as bad. You mentioned offensive and defensive CI activities. So how can SOF ensure its information infrastructure, operations, activities, and investments are properly protected from the fee on the defensive side uh, while maintaining its competitive advantages and still leverage its counterintelligence force in partnership with the interagency and the services to impose cost against the fee, uh, both at home and abroad. Yeah, I think again, this is where in the DOD environment in the SOCOM enterprise, this is unequivocally a responsibility of commanders. I, I joke at times or I quip that, you know, I was used to eye rolls my entire career. You're a counterintelligence guy and you walk into the room and you get an eye roll from the commander because somehow you're going to deliver some bad information because that's what commanders were conditioned to dealing with negative information coming not from somebody that was delivering intelligence, but de delivering negative information about what the enemy is doing to you. Culturally, again, commanders can change that. They can flip the script. And I was blessed again by the commanders that I worked with, knowing that I was a counterintelligence a agent integrated me into UW exercises. I understood unconventional warfare by behaving like uh, a threat to a guerrilla network. Those were in my formative days. So in short, I had commanders that's operationally that took risks with exercises and gave the counterintelligence teammates a wide berth. In garrison, in this is where SOCOM 
has a tendency, not SOCOM, but the enterprise and soft operators, that they are conditioned to wanting to focus on their core mission. And anything that distracts them from the core mission, like somebody wanting to talk about counterintelligence, somebody wanting to talk about shaping conditions uh, to support other agencies conducting an investigation, that can be perceived as a distraction. Those are cultural shifts. And I'll give you an example. I was the J2X at U.S. Central Command, when that was a huge enterprise, I had perhaps over 100, 150 people, contractors at the height of um, multiple wars overseas. I was responsible for both human intelligence as well as uh, counterintelligence, not to mention detention operations or interrogation operations overseas, having some oversight over throughout C Central Command's AOR. At the same time, with all of that, we built mechanisms to bring in Air Force OSI uh, and NIS and the FBI field office to integrate them into not just our, our uh, security talks, not from a defensive standpoint exclusively, but also uh, sharing information to the extent they 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 could do so. And uh, so we approached it like any other mini task force to ensure that we were protecting our equities. And, and that's not really an entirely articulate, uh, uh, you know, uh, recount of, of what we did. Suffice to say, it was the idea of sharing information, coordinating information, protecting information in the event that the, the FBI in CONUS or whoever the counterintelligence proponent is uh, could conduct some operations. And I was a trusted agent in that process. And that's really important because that allowed me to get access for the FBI to the four-star general. It allowed me to get access um, of the um, OSI or NCIS, I said NIS, NCIS, to get access to the four-star. So I had that kind of credibility because of my people uh, that, that I serve with as the J2X. So I think that this idea of task forces, this idea of establishing a culture um, is absolutely crucial. And uh, the FBI, I would just make a, a vignette that may or may not be appropriate, but I, I want to uh, just talk about the relationships. By establishing a relationship from a counterintelligence standpoint with the FBI, when I had a source overseas that I wanted uh, brought back to the United States, sponsored, and uh, brought back because he was at risk overseas, I didn't know who to turn to. It was the FBI counterintelligence team that was able to open up their network at FBI headquarters to essentially get this uh, foreign actor, um, a green card brought to the United States uh, to, to live uh, without threat of being killed, which is the threat that he was under serving special operations needs overseas. In short, the FBI were great partners for counterintelligence, but also they have a vast enterprise that they can plug into for a variety of other things that pop for not only SOCOM, but in the case of Tampa, also U.S. Central Command. I agree. FBI has been phenomenal partners over the years and continue to be uh, phenomenal partners in today's counterintelligence fight. Um, some other partners that I would would like to highlight is Department of Commerce. Uh, I mean, they have very unique authorities. And when you look at some of the technologies that the adversary is looking at, partnering with them on a counterintelligence side of the house is a no-brainer. I mean, uh, from their export enforcement authorities to their ability to do end-use checks and verify that the technology is being used the way it was uh, supposed to be and going to the right uh, parties and not being diverted is is huge. Same thing with HSI. HSI has 
very broad authorities, both within the U.S. and abroad, and have been a phenomenal partner over the years. Um, the you mentioned OSI, you mentioned NCIS, um, Army Counterintelligence uh, Command. Now that it's established, and so one of the questions I have is how best do we instead of having stovepipes where everyone's worried about their turf, everyone's worried about their specific piece of the pie coming together, much like how soft does and how the JTTFs did and how the task forces have done over the years, uh, embracing uh, the team of teams concept. Um, we've come up with a, a mnemonic called R2P recognize report and partner. So being able to recognize when you have the authorities to conduct something, what a counter, what is a counterintelligence indicator, who it should go to, being able to report it in a timely and effective manner uh, in the right system, and then being able to partner, show that soft value proposition and say, hey, as a counterintelligence professional within the soft enterprise, this is the value that I bring to the table. This is why you want to partner with me. One, it optimizes resources, it increases capability, and it allows those organizations, uh, the MDCOs or the interagency, to now uh, divert, divide their workforce even more uh, because they have competent partners within the soft enterprise to conduct counterintelligence activities. No, that makes good sense to me. I mean, the first time we discussed that was was yesterday. Uh, the acronym was, was new to me, but the principle, uh, you know, that's what I articulated in terms of what we tried to do at uh, at U.S. Central Command in terms of our relationships, not just with the FBI, but other, other agencies. And uh, the rest will follow when you build a platform to break down the barriers, uh, to ensure that there's information sharing. And uh, I want to make the point, spent a lot of time doing exercises in CONUS with with special mission units, uh, FBI, working with the FBI, with HSI, understanding their authorities, their uh, approach to proliferation and counterproliferation, I should say. So all good actors, and you're right about commerce or in a counterterrorism fight, understanding equities for treasury and the tools that that they have available to them. I mean, one of my busiest uh, directors at the White House was my treasury uh, expert, right, that could help with sanctions. These are all important instruments and in having respect of organizations. Now, I'm going to make, uh, I don't want this to be misconstrued, but I've heard about Army reorganizing their counterintelligence. I've engaged with foreign countries the last couple of years, their heads of their counterintelligence services, but I don't have a sense for where Army counterintelligence is going other than what I've heard uh, anecdotally. So the question, this is rhetorical, it's not a critical comment, it's rhetorical. Is the Army engaging with its alumni? Are they out talking to people about lessons learned? Um, I don't know. Um, I have these discussions, as I say, with foreign partners, but I don't have a sense for what the Army G2 is doing writ large. Maybe I'm not looking in the right place, but it's really, really important at this juncture, given the threat uh, statement that you read and all of what we've talked about today, that we are sharing lessons, and I know that people bristle when they hear about lessons learned and they talk about lessons relearned or not learned at all. All of that aside, it is absolutely crucial that we engage with people that have been in this fight for a really long time. Hence the reason why I brought in gray beards to look under my tent and to help look at what we were doing and sharing till it hurts. And those are principles I learned from the special operations community generally, but specifically from general officers like John Mulholland, Sean Mulholland, and uh, General McChrystal. Yeah, as far as the Army counterintelligence reform, I'm not going to go down that road. Um, the 
one thing I will say is we we often tend to uh, want to reorganize or we want to uh, come up with some new bureaucratic uh, process to put in place rather than really look at what matters. And soft looks at that because it's soft truth number one, and that is people are more important than hardware. And when you look at the people, you empower those people, you give them the uh, the leadership necessary to act and know that you got their back, they will go out and, and accomplish amazing things. And that's what uh, McChrystal did. That's what uh, a number uh, of others have done over the years. General Thomas, um, sitting here, uh, General Nicolay, um, here within the J2. And I, I, I sit there and I see how when you have the right leaders in place, it's not about the process. These, it's not about the, the creating a new organization. It's about trusting those individuals within your organization to take your vision and, and, and actually make it a reality and come up with those innovative, proactive, out-of-the-box approaches that's going to put those adversaries back on their heels. And that's what you were talking about within the Cold War. And what we need to do is look at how we put the adversary back on its heels back then and see if any of those uh, same practices can be applied today. Now, I understand we're in a digital environment. We interconnected. Uh, information dominance is necessary. But if we don't sit there and learn from our past, we're destined to repeat our past. And so I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I don't want to take up uh, too much more of the time. I open up uh, the floor to a couple of questions from our audience. I'm sitting here looking at them. And one of the things that they, uh, our audience is concerned about is our RDA side of the house, our research development and acquisition. Um, SOCOM has a unique authorities in that realm. And how can soft counterintelligence professionals help protect our competitive advantage uh, within that, uh, that space? Well, I think it's a classic problem and this is a universal problem irrespective of technologies. Um, it's all about educating the workforce. It's all about uh, counterintelligence agents. And this is a really important point. We didn't get into a lot of tactical, how I did my business in the 90s, but I recognized that to catch a spy, you had to hang a sign that said spy catchers. You had to advertise your presence. You have to communicate. You can't hide behind a door. You have to go out and build relationships with people. And that's counterintelligence has to aggressively engage the people that they are protecting. Um, yes. And it takes a lot of work, but it's as simple as that. That is uncomplicated. Now, I realize technology transfers and the way uh, um, secrets are stolen and how tools are used, backdoor tools like solar winds. I understand all of that. That notwithstanding, it is about ensuring absolute seamless communication on the kind of threats the organization's facing. And counterintelligence it might not be good enough to have, uh, you know, to have a um, intelligence entity that has proponency, be that NCIS or Army intelligence to deal with the workforce. It, it might be a multidimensional effort that includes staff counterintelligence, uh, complementing uh, and working closely with those operational entities. Um, I don't know how to say it any more plainly than communication is key. Now, that might not satisfy the question asker, uh, but at the end of the day, um, those were lessons I learned early on in my career um, to identify, you know, what uh, also what the adversaries are looking for and to make sure the workforce understands what to protect. Uh, what are the key 
information elements that have to be protected. What can I talk about? How can I write about it? Who do I go to before I publish an article on these things? These are uh, security matters that still are linked you know, to uh, counterintelligence, clearly. So that's a simplistic answer, but I know no better way than to charge um, counterintelligence with really engaging the workforce and having a dialogue and trying not to make it adversarial or condescending uh, and move beyond, you know, people going online to do their their periodic, you know, uh, uh, security, you know, online tests, right? I yeah. mean, I will tell you, Mike, just as a digression, I wanted to talk about this more. I've talked I've talked to the the commander of SOCOM about some of my work since I left government supporting a task force that was going on after MS-13, where the finish was justice, the finish was indictments. And it was really eye-opening for me. And it was eye-watering what DOJ, FBI, HSI were doing against those threats. And the acronym you use, the idea, of, which I forget, OSADEF, the idea that uh, we work with host nation and train them in our judicial outputs uh, to help build a relationship so they can successfully prosecute and then ensure that we can help protect uh, people that are speaking out against corruption in those respective countries where MS-13 may operate. All of those things mattered and are linked candidly to this idea of breaking down barriers, communicating and learning and applying what we learn to a different threat dynamic. I got a little bit off topic, but you reminded <laughs> me of that earlier, uh, the idea of, of uh, you know, operating in, uh, in places like Central America and, and doing partnership engagement and training and esoteric things like justice. Well, commun like you said, communication is key. If, as a counterintelligence professional, if you can't communicate both up and down the chain, if you can't com communicate to your leaders why counterintelligence matters and can't communicate that down to your subordinates on how to get after the, the counterintelligence threats and then communicate it laterally to your partners, then you are in the wrong – What, in my opinion, you are in the wrong profession. Um, for those counterintelligence professionals that are – uh, feel that they've been uh, forgotten or marginalized because of the past 20 years. I tell you that the leadership here uh, within the command and across the enterprise has placed a high value in counterintelligence, has given you the authorities and the permissions and the oversight necessary to do your counterintelligence mission. If there is a, a hindrance in that, um, then please come up on the net. So I had to put that plug out there. As we as we look at counterintelligence awareness, since you brought that up, the counterintelligence awareness and reporting program, the I literally had just came come from doing a counterintelligence uh, briefing uh, to our soft ATL partners. So I, I I know the importance of getting in front of a, an audience, being able to create that connection, being able to highlight those threats, and then being able to uh, be personable enough for them to come up and ask those questions and not, like you said, not be condescending, not being able to to say, hey, you, you don't know any better. It's, hey, this is the threat. This is how you can help protect yourself, your family, your mission, this command, and this country from our adversarial uh intelligence agencies, as well as terrorist organizations. Um, I'm going to transition back to the audience for the last final question, which was, as we look at irregular warfare and what's going on over in Ukraine, I know this is kind of uh, off, the, off the cuff, but I'm going to ask it. What can counterintelligence do in support of irregular warfare activities 
um, both within SOF and uh, within the conventional force to help illuminate the threat, but also uh, going back to finding that finish, be it imposing cost or uh, potentially, uh, as I've from looking at my library here in front of me, uh, doing double agentry or some other type of offensive operation. So that's a brilliant question and very timely. So right before we met today, an article that I wrote was just published in The Hill. So as of noon today, uh, a, an article was published on surrogates. Um, it, and I was very mindful of sensitivities related to surrogate operations, but there's been a lot in the press of late. And generically, uh, surrogate operations, proxy operations have been a part of warfare um, forever. Uh, all of that said, counterintelligence has a crucial role in surrogate operations. Read the article and you'll see what my central thesis is, which is we should uh, redouble our focus on proxy warfare and surrogate warfare. Our adversaries are very good at it and they're adept at applying it either uh, with Houthis uh, in Iranian proxies or with militia movements in Syria with some tragic results uh, are the, the Iranians specifically. So counterintelligence has a crucial role in asking the tough questions in doing the appropriate investigations of surrogate operations. And I will reference a book that I think is extraordinarily important. A lot of people poo-poo it because it was written in the 70s or the 80s. It was by Angelo Cotavilla, who just passed away. It's called Informing Statecraft. And he talks about what counterintelligence can do in terms of covert action. I'm not talking about covert action. I'm talking about sensitive activities. I'm talking about special operations. If you read the book, and you embrace some of the lessons that he imparted, I think it, it it's a hopeful lesson for people that do serious counterintelligence work. And then if you don't believe Cota Villa, I would ask you to trust that I built counterintelligence into a task force after we lost human beings, sub sources, uh, you know, to the threat in both Afghanistan and, and Iraq. And the bottom line, it was it was counterintelligence professionals I turned to because I needed them to ask the tough questions. I needed them to throw cold water on me, on our operations. So Cota Villa's book is an excellent book at talking about how counterintelligence can support co covert action, but you could easily make the case for sensitive activities and how it would support surrogate activities. In other words, assessing your network. Those are important imperatives for unconventional warfare, for proxy warfare, for surrogate warfare. So I would ensure that we always build counterintelligence to those activities. And I just want to, you know, foot stomp on the importance of, of special operations for something we collectively do very well, which is unconventional warfare, surrogate operations. Uh, and, and I think it's worth uh, thinking through. I couldn't agree more. The The risk associated from the foreign intelligence apparatus targeting those surrogate operations, um, the risks associated with those insider threats in partnering environments, the fact that they can be infiltrated, co-opted, or what we saw over in Afghanistan, just grievance-based. A, a lot of it was individuals uh, within the Afghani uh, police and military that weren't being treated uh, with respect, weren't being treated as human beings, and instead uh, sought a way to, to have a an effect, um, be it they go in and kill their own uh, fellow members or uh, green on blue incidents where we had uh, partners killing uh, Americans. So especially as we look at surrogate operations, as we look at irregular warfare uh, activities, 
and making sure counterintelligence is integrated early and often is crucial. And on that note, I'll turn it back over to you for final comments. But I just want to say uh, in closing on behalf of the Joint Special Operations University, the soft enterprise and counterintelligence enterprises, uh, please accept my gratitude and thanks for your participation in this interview and your service to our nation. Thank you. And uh, the last word yours. Hey, Mike, I want to thank you for your service and what you're doing for the counterintelligence enterprise and more particularly for Joint Special Operations University. Uh, truly, you, are, you all are sharpening the edge, honing the tools to give soft a competitive advantage, and uh, I very much appreciate it. It's a privilege anytime I have an opportunity to talk to uh, the soft community. Um, people know how to get a hold of me if there's anything I can do for the community. I hope people will reach out. I want to also underscore that I very much uh, appreciate the leadership at SOCOM. General Fenton, I have a long history with, and Rich Clark before him, and General Thomas, uh, General Votel. Uh, I still turn to these individuals and reach out to them and continue to learn from them. So I think we are postured really to get this right. It's going to take some time, but thanks. Keep doing what you're doing. The first tier for this fight is really education as a foundation and, uh, and sharing information. So I really appreciate the opportunity. It's always a privilege for me to engage with this community.